the pandemic. So we're really excited about that. Um, it will be from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. We'll have a catered lunch and it will be at the Baha'i International Community offices. For those who don't know, um, that's pretty much right across the street from the UN. So we hope that you all can join us there. Um, this is also an election year for the committee. So anyone who has um, an interest in having a role on the committee's bureau, um, please do reach out to us and let us know. Um, I think typically most of the bureau members tend to stay on for a few terms. And so we, we are not sure yet if we will have open positions, but knowing other people's interest in joining the Bureau is always good. Um, even if there isn't a, a specific position open, we can typically find a role for you to help out in some capacity. Um, the second announcement is that we will be hosting another event in New York um, probably also at the Baha'i Community Center, if not at the United Nations itself, on or around October 25th. And that is because our new uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, um, Naz, who many of you know, she will be delivering uh, Dr. Shahid's report to the United Nations on that day. Um, so when one special repertoire is outgoing and the other is incoming, um, the incoming delivers the report of the outgoing. Um, so she will be there and we would love to, um, we will be having a meeting with her. We're just finalizing the logistics now. And then the third and final announcement is that we will be sending out an email in the coming days. It will likely come from our treasurer, uh, John Amons, um, with regard to dues for the committee. So if you have not already paid your 2022 dues, which most of us have not. Um, John will be following up with you. And we now have an, a nice online system for dues collections. It's called Cheddar Up. It's a great system. Um, and, and you'll be receiving a link to that. So I will move now on to our program for today. We have three excellent speakers. Um, I, I know two of them are on. I'm just scrolling through here to see if the third has joined yet. Um, I don't believe she has, but I, I'm sure she will soon. Uh, we have Bonnie Dugal, who is also a part of this committee. We have Tong Nguyen uh, from BPSOS, and we have um, one of the individuals who works with Dr. Tong, uh, Luen Nguyen, as well. Um, and so before we turn to the International Day, which will be our main focus today of the event, um, We've asked Bonnie to just provide us with some updates from the two major international religious freedom conferences that took place this summer. And so the first of those conferences was the Earth Summit that took place in Washington, DC, and then subsequently the Earth Ministerial, which took place in London. And before I do turn it over to Bonnie, I wanted to briefly explain why we have these two separate conferences. I know it can be a bit confusing and we've received many questions from people in the committee as to what's the difference between them. Um, they seem to be sort of running parallel to each other. And so I, I thought I'd provide a very brief history. And that brief history is that uh, starting in 2018, after Sam Brownback became the US Earth ambassador, uh, he launched the first ever ministerial here in Washington, DC, really as a way to bring together many countries on this issue so that, you know, traditionally it's been seen as a U.S. led initiative to advance religious freedom internationally. And of course, more and more countries over the years have been um, doing great work on this issue. And he wanted to just sort of officially bring together a coalition of the countries that were working together on this. And actually, I think over 82 countries attended that first ministerial. And so the U.S. government hosted the second annual in 2019 um, and about 100 countries attended in 2019. And there were, of course, not only government components, there were civil society components as well. Um, but I think at that time, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty as to what would happen in the 2020 election. And I think there was a sense that those who were involved in these ministerials and this movement and bringing together so many countries didn't want there to be a loss of momentum if the government were to change and, and it, they weren't to carry on these ministerials. And so the idea was they would sort of, you know, get other countries to commit to hosting these meetings as well, so that it's not just a U.S.-led uh, initiative, but rather a truly 
uh, multilateral global initiative. And so they got several countries to line up for the next um, hosting roles, Poland, Brazil, the UK. Uh, so in 2020, Poland hosted the ministerial, but it was purely virtual. I don't think it turned out as well as people would have hoped it would. And then in 2021, Brazil was supposed to host and they pulled out last minute because of COVID and other issues. Um, and so in when when that became clear in 2021, Ambassador Brownback, uh, I think, decided, well, I, we really don't want to lose this momentum that we need to have some sort of event. And so that's why he created the Earth Summit, uh, which is more of a civil society based uh, conference um, that went so well, they decided to do it again this year, even though the UK had already agreed to host the ministerial, they decided to do both and sort of separate tracks. And so that's why we have both of them. They both have government components and civil society components, but the ministerial really is aimed at bringing governments together at the highest level, rather than just having a few come in as in speaker roles. And the summit um, is much more geared toward, you know, the grassroots and bringing civil society leaders together. Um, so just in a nutshell, that's why we have these two separate uh, components. I believe Bonnie is with us. Uh, Mac, you can help me identify I don't her here, though. We have one iPhone. Um, okay. Unlisted Bonnie, might that be you on the iPhone? If not, um, one of us could reach out to her and we can certainly switch gears. If we Kelsey, need to. Kelsey, they're finishing up the other meeting now. Uh, oh, is we it still on. going? Yeah, yeah, it's finishing up right now. I just came from there. So ran, overran. Very interesting. No worries. Yeah, I didn't know it had run over um, because I left early. So oh, there she that's, is. that's perfectly fine. <laughs> okay. Bonnie, just in time. We were just handing things over um, to you. I know your other event just finished up. So if you'd prefer us to start with Vietnam, we can do that. Otherwise, we can jump into just an overview of the, the conference and the summit. Um, it's completely up to you. Uh, can you give me just two minutes? Because I literally, I've gone Absolutely. from event to event. Yes, no, no problem whatsoever. Um, I'm happy actually to just turn to the International Day first and we can start with that and then come back to uh, the, the ministerial and the summit just keep in mind the brief history uh, that we just talked about <laughs> for when we get there. Um, so turning back to this International Day, it was first introduced in the General Assembly in 2019. Um, there's real, there was really nothing else like it. Um, so I know several of you just came from another event on this day and um, you know we're really thrilled that there is so much activity going on around this day because as some backstory, I was actually involved in the negotiations for the resolution that created this day. And one difficulty that, that came up during these negotiations was choosing what calendar day would be um, you know, the annual marker for this. And there were some days that were proposed um, based on perhaps an event that happened that affected one or more religious communities. And then ultimately, it was decided that the day that would be chosen should not be significant to one group and not others. And so they chose August 22nd because it sort of fit that bill and no other international day um, was on this date. But one of the problems with this date is that the UN is not in session. And so this is a, a somewhat difficult time to garner a lot of advocacy around um, a topic when no one's really at the UN right now, actually most of the diplomats and, and UN Secretariat are on holiday during this time. So we're just really grateful that there were so many events that the Earth Roundtable put on such a great event um, that our colleagues and friends in, in the UK did the same. And, and that's why we're always trying to um, commemorate this day with an event as well. Um, the, the UN has a little blurb actually on their website that, you know, in international days are actually very important. Of course, they predate the establishment of the United Nations, but the United Nations has always embraced them and created them because they are powerful tools. Um, number one, to educate the public on an issue. Number two, to mobilize action and resources. And number three, um, what they call to celebrate achievement. And, and in this case, achievement would really look like the reduction of violence and persecution against religious minorities. Um, so today we will be turning primarily to Vietnam 
and the violence that we've seen there against religious minorities. And not only that, but I, I believe I, it was mentioned perhaps in the note that went out with the invitation, but Vietnam is one of the few, if not only governments um, that actually takes issue with this international day and tries to shut down any recognition of it. And so we thought we'd hear from um, two experts uh, on persecution of religious minorities in Vietnam who can shed some light on some recent developments there. Um, so I'll turn to our speakers. Um, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Tong Nguyen. I'll introduce him first and then I'll hand it over to him. He is having some connection problems, um, but he is with us at least by phone if, not, if the video is not working. Um, a refugee from Vietnam in 1988, Dr. Nguyen joined Boat People SOS as a volunteer. And in 2001, he became the full-time executive director under his leadership, BPSOS has rescued or assisted in the rescue of 11,000 victims of human trafficking in 26 countries, and they have successfully advocated for 20,000 repatriated Vietnamese boat people to be resettled to the United States. In 2015, Dr. Tong co-launched the Southeast Asia Freedom of Religion or Belief, also known as CFORB initiative. He currently serves on the steering committee of the, Interna of the International Religious Freedom Summit and on the Council of Experts of the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance. Um, so Dr. Tong, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelsey, and uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm sorry that I cannot join you with my uh, camera because of the very weak somewhat weak signal here at the location where I, I am. I will start to say that um, today's web are very much appropriate and opportune with regard to Vietnam. And I'm going to present two topics that, are, that should be unrelated, but thanks to the recent actions by the Vietnamese government they are now intimately connected. The first topic involves the first topic involves the hindrance by the government authorities of uh, against their citizens' observance of the International Day, uh, commemorating victims of ethnic violence based on religion or belief. And the second topic is a set of legal challenges that ADF International and both people as well as have been working together for the past two years to support these legal challenges, try to force the hands of the Vietnamese government to come out to publicly and officially admit that groups that come together to pray, to practice their faith without forming an organization are not required, again, not required to register with the government. So those two topics are now interrelated. So let me present the first topic first, and that is uh, the hindrance, the efforts by the Vietnamese government to hinder uh, the observance of this special international day. So Vietnam not only targets the different independent religious communities, churches, uh, we call them independent because they don't submit themselves to the control by the government. So the government um, use violence, harassment, uh, even torture, imprisonment uh, to force them to either abandon the faith or join government-controlled organizations. And not only that, since 2019, the government authorities at different levels have worked very adamantly to block citizens from observing this International Day, which is August 22nd. Nevertheless, despite all those acts of intimidation and violence and threats and harassment, this year, 52 groups have registered with us, 
notified us that they would hold observance activities for this day. And actually, so far, most of them have only held those uh, commemorating activities last week or this last weekend. Those include 23 Montagna Christian house churches, nine Catholic congregations. I'd like to add one more that just held the, the activities without notifying us. 20 cow die communities and one Buddhist community. Since 2019, from the very first observance of the, this special day, we have documented numerous cases of government interference with citizens marking this day. Basically, the citizens were told that doing so, that is observing this day, violated Vietnam's law or was tantamount to denouncing the government for violations of human rights and especially the right to religious freedom, which is actually the case because um, the government of Vietnam really committed violence and, and harassment against its citizens for uh, the faith. Let me give a few examples here. Just five days after August 22nd into 2020, a cow Dai dignitary, Mr. Chen Van Bear, in Tien Giang province. He was abducted in the street. And not only that, his son, his college age son, was abducted from his workplace. And both father and son were held for interrogation and, and threats at the police station for 10 to 12 hours. And they were ordered to stop the deceased from ever observing that day. Another example is the Buddhist, Buddhist Chen Van Thường in Barrio Bung Tau province. On September 10th of 2020, he too became victim of the government because his family held an observance of the International Day. In the dead of the night, his son, working as a guard at a resort, um, a tourist place, was abducted by the police and taken to the police station. And by dawn, Mr. Tuong learned about his disappearance, his son's disappearance. So his entire family came to the police station and many of them got arrested. And they became victims of uh, violence at the police station. And again, they were told not to observe the International Day in the future. And the last example is involves Mr. Ethan Nye, a house church leader. He's a Montagna Christian in Chu Maga, Daklak province. Last year, on September, on sorry, fe February 26, he was taken to the police station, interrogated, and told not to observe International Day. And that was done late because he did the observance six months earlier. However, the government of Vietnam, the authorities were very clever. They never left a trace of the harassment and the hindrance. For, instance, for example, the threats were made verbally. There was no report of the interrogation sessions in writing ever. The invitation, they call them invitation, but actually those are summoned to the police station, were given out and they're taken back by the police officers. So there was no evidence of the harassment, of the non-compliance with, uh, with the U, their commitments to the UN. But surprisingly, on June 10th of this year, the chairman of the People's Committee of Chu Magar District in Daklak Province, issued decisions in writing to find three Montagna Christian leaders, including Mr. Ising Nye that I just mentioned. And they belong to two local house churches. Each was fined four million Vietnam dollars, which is equivalent to 170 USD, US dollars. That's a quite hefty sum, equivalent to about three months of family income for these people in, in their area. And they were fined because they had observed 
August 22nd is the National Day in 2021. And that was about 10 months earlier. For observing December 10th is the National Human Rights Day in 2021. And for participating in group religious practice at a private home without prior government approval. For the first time ever, we have in writing evidence of the Vietnamese government not only hindering its citizens from observing this international day, but also penalizing them for doing so. We believe that uh, the, the new UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief just sent a communication to the Vietnamese government expressing concern over these incidents. Today, just earlier today, the new U.S. human rights officer at the Consulate General in Saigon met with seven representatives of religious communities in Vietnam, and six of them had been harassed and threatened because of the observance of the International Day. And we, both people as well, in order to track response from the Vietnamese government um, for this year, we have deployed our team of local rapporteur to monitor each community that has registered with us and report any incident. Unfortunately, sadly, there are already one major incident on August 20th, that is two days ago. In Long Xuyen City, Anzang Province, the police from the provincial police department came to the house of Khao Dai members who were not celebrating, who were not uh, conducting the observance. They were just conducting religious activities. And they were told, they were forced to sign a statement pledging not to observe August 22nd International Day this year. After resisting for eight hours, they finally gave up and signed the pledge. Now, let me mention about and talk about very briefly about the second topic, and that is the legal challenges that ADF International and both of SOS have been working together uh, to, to, to kind of force the hands of the government of Vietnam to come out in public and officially and in writing, admitting that groups like the Khao Dai group like I just mentioned, or the Montagna Christian 